All right, everyone. Well, good evening and welcome to our Spotlight Talk with artist Mark Dion. My name is Moyer Anderson and I am the Associate Director of Public Programs here at Crystal Bridges Museum. As we begin, I want to recognize Crystal Bridges' role as settlers and guests in the Northwest Arkansas region. We acknowledge the Cato, Quapaw, and Osage, as well as the many indigenous caretakers of this land and water. We appreciate the enduring influence of the vibrant, diverse, and contemporary cultures of indigenous peoples. We are conscious of the role in colonization that museums have played. As cultural institutions, we have a responsibility to engage in the dismantling of historical and systemic invisibility of indigenous peoples past, present, and future. We choose to intentionally hold ourselves accountable to appropriate conversation, representation, connection, and education to facilitate a space of measurable change. It's such an honor to welcome you all virtually, and whether you're joining us here over Zoom or tuning in through Facebook, we're thrilled to have this opportunity to bring uh, this lecture to an audience from all over the country. So tonight, I am pleased to introduce artist Mark Dion and curator Mindy Bisa for a conversation on the unique work that is currently a part of the exhibition Crystal Bridges at 10. And if you haven't visited the exhibition yet, I would strongly encourage you to carve out some time to come and experience this exhibition and really heavy on the word experience. Crystal Bridges at 10 is an immersive exhibition uh, that with 10 distinct art experiences celebrating the museum's collection and the local community one decade into the museum's lifetime. Primarily drawing from the museum's collection, the exhibition features over 130 artworks presenting crowd favorites in new ways, showcasing works that have never before been on view in the museum and lifting up artist voices. The section of the exhibition we're going to dive into this evening is a collection of works inspired by four elements of air, earth, fire, and water designed by the artist Mark Dion. Mark Dion is an American conceptual artist whose practice examines the history of the museum and the presentation of knowledge. Through a rigorous examination and recreation of traditional methods of display, he calls into question the hierarchies of aesthetics and conventions of historical proof and reason. Dion often uses the artifice of an archeological or scientific tone in his work too. And Dion's work can be found in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Tate Gallery in London, the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, and the Center Pompidou in Paris. And of course, right now at Crystal Bridges Museum. Mark tonight is tuning in from New York this evening. It's wonderful to see you, Mark. And joining Mark in conversation is co-curator of the exhibition Crystal Bridges at 10, Mindy Bisa. Mindy serves as curator of American art and the director of fellowships and research here at Crystal Bridges, overseeing the American art collection covering colonial times to the 1960s and the Tyson Scholars of American Art Fellowship Program. Her projects and exhibitions at the museum include an award-winning 2018 renovation and reinstallation of the Early American Art Galleries, co-curator of Cross Pollination, Martin Johnson Heed, Thomas Cole, Frederick Edwin Church, and our contemporary moment. And just a small plug, mark your calendars now, folks, because it's going to be on view at Crystal Bridges uh, this year and on November 20th. And Mindy is also co-curator of Companion Species, an exhibition in partnership with the Museum of Native American History here in Bentonville, Arkansas. And of course, alongside curator Lauren Haynes, co-curator of the Crystal Bridges at 10 exhibition, where she is also tuning in from in the actual gallery space here tonight. So this evening, Mindy is going to be leading the conversation with Mark. Again, please send your questions in at any moment during the talk and we'll leave a little bit of time at the end to address them. But Mindy and Mark, what a treat to have you both here this evening. Thank you, lovely to be here. Hi Mark, it's good Hi, to Mindy. see you even if I Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. 
Okay, can you see me okay? And you can see your installation in the back? Uh, I only see actually the picture of you, Larissa and I. Oh, okay, now I see you. Okay, oh. there you go. Hi. Okay, do you see me? Okay, great. I do. I don't see myself, so we'll all get over this. So um, yes, first to address the picture, Larissa Randall is there pictured with us. And um, it is just my pleasure to also extend great thanks to Larissa as curatorial assistant and um, couldn't have done this exhibition without her. So Mark, uh, I thought that what we would do tonight is walk through, of course, this amazing installation, but I also wanna talk a little bit about your practice you know, how you came about thinking about organizing all of these objects into the categories of air, where I'm sitting right now, earth, water, and fire. And um, what we have is some installation shots, so we can walk through those. And then for the audience, what I also thought would be fun is to show you a little behind the scenes of how we were actually able to, over the course of the last six to eight months, work on this project largely remotely. So how does that sound? That just sounds great. Okay. Um, let's see, let's go to the next slide just to kick it off. Um, what I wanted to show was, um, well, myself having a lot of fun because this is the most fun I feel like I've had as an art curator since I became an art curator. I actually got to pack up little objects such as a hedgehog for this project. Um, on the upper left is a drawing by Jesse Mueller, our exhibition designer, which you can see in the upper right there, taking a picture of the bird cabinet, um, who really laid out your vision uh, in a way that we could kind of work remotely and electronically through checklists and things like that. But I wanna to go to the, we'll come back to our partners at the U of A. Um, maybe Megan or Moira forward to slide number four. But Mark, do you wanna first talk about your conception for the project as we're looking at this installation, Josh? Sure, and you know, I, this was a great opportunity to work with you, uh, Mindy, because we, we've had a few tries before and things have not really exactly worked out, but that did give us an opportunity to, uh, for me to see the collection and to see the breadth of the collection. And also, um, you know, I worked with the university in Fayetteville and had a really incredibly positive experience um, working there. And that also entailed seeing the collections at the university. So I knew that there were rich collections uh, that, that had depth and were, had uh, really, um, uh, were kind of idiosyncratic and uh, dynamic. And uh, so I, I knew that there was this, I guess I could even call it material uh, that I could use for this project. Um, so when, when you suggested that we maybe try again and come up with another idea, uh, I thought, you know, this this is great because I actually I know I know what we have. I know what we have to work with. I know I know that something uh, ambitious and energetic and strange could actually be realized, uh, have, having had that experience behind the scenes. And and you know, it's one of my, you know, I, I think anyone who spends time behind the scenes of any museum knows that behind the scenes is really where it's at. The public exhibitions are wonderful and they're great, but if the minute you pull back that curtain and walk behind the scenes, you really see how a museum functions and you really see what kinds of possibilities there are uh, with, with material. So I, you know, so I, I knew that this was really possible. Of course, there's great stuff. Having great stuff is one problem, is one or one solution. Uh, the other, the thing is to know what to do with it. And so, you know, how do you arrange it in a way that um, erodes the kind of categories that we're so used to working with? You know, whether that's chronology or style or region or, uh, or even subject matter. So I wanted to find a way that we could be a little more dynamic in how we put things together. 
And um, you know, often when I'm faced with this as an idea, I go back to you know the pre-enlightenment collections. You know, so once um, you know in, during the Enlightenment, when museums come come into being, the, or the museums that we recognize come into being, you know, we we they they kind of agree on uh, some aspects of of uh, a universal method of collecting. You know, universal systems of of um, of organization, and of course, we know these are not universal at all, but. Um, and so uh, what's interesting about the earlier period, but you know, the Wunderkammer, the cabinet of curiosity, is that they are incredibly idiosyncratic. You know, the cabinet of curiosity, what's the most interesting thing about it to me is not how it's like or how it anticipates modern museums, but rather how it's completely dissimilar to modern museums. That's what makes the um, the window camera interesting. And that's what makes it uh, an interesting model to look at because things are organized in categories that um, you know we would never imagine organizing them today. So one example, and Moira, if you can go to the next um, slide. So this is one of my favorite pairings, <laughs> which is just actually right behind me um, on my right hand side. So Mark, what made you pick air, earth, water, and fire? You know, it's 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 not as though the um, pre-enlightenment collections have no system of classification. That, that, you know, some of them uh, they do, but they're they're relying very much on um, on mystical traditions, or you know, there or or um, or traditions like uh, like the classics. So. Uh, you know, air, earth, air, fire, and water are, of course, the four elements that are primarily identified, uh, you know, by Aristotle, Aristotle about three, 2,300 and something years ago. And, you know, that's, um, that really, you know, Aristotle, his influence is just tremendous. Uh, and, uh, and he very much is influencing the way people in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance are thinking and thinking about things. I mean, in some way, his influences are also quite pernicious because he's really, um, he, he doesn't really anticipate um, science. In fact, perhaps his ideas even hold science back. Um, but these, these categories are, uh, are interesting in that they have a kind of flexibility and, and, uh, and can be dynamic and can be very playful. And, and those, are, those are things that I was very interested in, in magnifying in this exhibition, you know, that there would be a, a playful exchange um, that we would have a really heterogeneous amount of uh, kind of uh, types of material presented side by side in a way that I think would be extremely evocative. Yes, and let's go to the next slide. This is an image also of air, and there you can see the painting and the insects uh, paired together on the wall. And what we're on the bottom right, we're starting to go into earth. And one of the things that um, I've been talking a lot to visitor services and protection services and other guests and giving tours of this exhibition and talking about how should a visitor come in here? How should we think about, Mark, for example, what's your media? You mentioned objects, you mentioned the university. So how is it that you as an, a conceptual artist are creating an installation? Should we still think about Benjamin West as an independent person and identifying each one of those flying insects and butterflies? Or is there a different way to kind of approach this? Well, I, I would hope that we're still able to see each individual thing uh, with its with its own integrity. But at the same time, you know, I, I am kind of boldly using these things as my material. And, uh, and that may even have some ethical issues and and considerations, which which I'm very interested to bring that up as a as a discussion point, right? Is it is it acceptable to use another artist's work as, as a material? Is it respectful to create these juxtapositions? And I really do think um, that we are being respectful. And, and I think we're also, uh, you know, the museum is not the 
only destination point for these objects. They've had long histories and they've had juxtapositions in spaces um, and with other things uh, long before they ever entered the Crystal Bridges collection. Uh, and the same is true for the, um, the historical cultural artifacts from the, from the university and the natural uh, history specimens. So I think that, you know, this is uh, where I'm, I'm trying to in some way nullify the alleged neutrality of the white cube um, by creating a space which is somewhat theatrical that uses these works uh, to create a kind of syntax that to make uh, another kind of experience. And I, and I want the spaces to feel very different. I want visitors to feel as though they've gone on a journey through these um, uh, through these rooms, and you know the the team at Crystal Bridges really understood very much from the beginning that we were going to try to make very uh, very evocative ambient spaces, and that we were going to um, do things like change the door heights and door sizes and door widths. We were going to work extensively with the lighting. We're going to color the rooms and, and work with different kinds of materials. And uh, we weren't going to shy away from, um, from the theatrical aspects of that. You know, we're, we're going to have wallpapers. We're going to, um, um, each room is going to feel very different. Uh, and so by the end of this, you feel like you have been, you know, through a kind of, uh, through a journey, through, through some kind of, um, experience yeah and you know so again that air it's very light it's bright it's white but talk about perhaps the wallpaper right so the wallpaper is um uh, uh it's it's a wallpaper that's printed with a variety of different images historical images that are are um uh sort of graphic images that depict a variety of things in flight from the uh, from the historical to the prehistorical, from the natural to the supernatural. So there are mythical beasts and there are flying insects and there are um, spirits and witches and all of these things sort of grouped together in a way to again um, have that, uh, that uh, heterogeneous approach to categories of things, right? So the, the, what binds all these things, of course, is that they fly and that they, that they are of the realm of the air. And, uh, but, but you might not expect them to be side by side. Um, a pterodactyl yeah. uh, and a witch normally are not found uh, in the same context. Yeah, and the same as a um, gas mask, which is about air, and then pipes, you know, so the air that comes through that, or eggs. And now what we're seeing is earth. So you go from the bright light into really an earthy room. Yeah, it's very, it's very densely packed. And uh, I think that this, um, this room really does mix materiality in a, in a, in a quite radical way where we have, um, you know, preserved snakes in formalin. We have vernacular objects. We have, um, um, things like tarantulas and, and, um, and crystals and minerals, uh, wagon wheels. So it's, it's, again, trying to talk about how we might, um, you know, how, how we might um, organize this material, how we might uh, embody a sense of the earth. And when I look at these things, I, you know, I am, I'm not just looking at sort of Renaissance collections. I'm also looking at Rena Renaissance allegorical paintings, right? So, um, you know, um, by people like Jan von Kessel and, and Jan Bruegel, some of my favorite painters um, who, um, you know, very much took on these allegories uh, in the way that, you know, a wonder camera itself might take on an allegorical approach to its system of organization, you know. The window camera might be organized. Um, you know, it might be a, a, a sort of a microcosm, macrocosm relationship where you're trying to get a diminutive example of, of the entire universe, or it might um, articulate uh, mystical properties, or it might merely be a, a showcase for exotic trophies. You know, of course, you know the window camera is very much um, a, a sort of symptom of of the new. Um, 
colonial endeavor in Europe and, um, and with all of its um, you know, horrific consequences and, 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 um, and uh, um, activities, right? So it, it can't be separated from um, the colonial endeavor, but at the same time, we have to think that they are, there is no one Wunderkammer. They are widely, wildly different in their approaches and in their structures and in what they are, are meant to illustrate. But one thing that unites them is that they're very discursive spaces, right? They're spaces that really encourage a kind of conversation uh, that, that make meaning, but are also uh, a tool in debating meaning, which, which is, is something that I would hope an exhibition like this is as well. You know, I would be, um, I would be saddened to think that people would walk through this uh, in, a, in a solemn, quiet sort of way. I would, I, you know, I hope an, an exhibition like this is in many ways uh, an attempt to um, delight and mystify and also hopefully provoke um, humor. You know, I mean, my ideal response from a viewer might be chuckles and, and, and laughs and, <laughs> and, um, and gasps of surprise, you know, so that, that's really what I'm, what I'm going for in a work like this. And, and I think, um, you know, there's always a, a degree of criticality, um, but with a project like this, I, I think, you know, there are many ways to be critical, but I think motivating um, curiosity and, and uh, using humor as a, as a foil is an important aspect of how I would like this to function. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, again, I've just spent so much time in the last six months um, kind of giggling and you know, <laughs> laughing in delight by some of the combinations that have really helped me see like a collection that I am very familiar with, but in completely different ways. It's not just about changing the wall color behind it. It's the whole context. And so when those, you know, flying insect wings kind of make you notice, oh gosh, this is a winged person. This is a Cupid figure. And then what if you change in that theatrics, the color that is reflected on the painting? So now we're in water and an aspect of this room is literally blue gels that make the whole space blue, except for one spotlight. You wanna talk about water? Yeah, I, I think I, maybe because I, I, you know, I grew up on the coast, you know, I grew up in New Bedford and for Haven, Massachusetts, a, and I, I feel a very strong affinity to water. I, I do a lot of work about marine environments and ocean health issues. So, so I, I kind of feel like water is the place where we pulled out all the stops in a, in a sense, and, and we're, we're perhaps the boldest. So there are one of the things about um, marine environments, of course, is that they, they do uh, they do represent just just a stunning uh, biological diversity. So we highlight some of that with um, by just giving a peek at some of the vast collection of marine invertebrates that the university holds, and so that includes shells and and starfish and sea stars and um, uh, and sea urchins. And things like that. Uh, we want to uh, we present some existing display furniture or or collections furniture, and then we open some of the drawers so you can get a sense of the vastness of these collections. That you know, essentially, you're, we are just showing the tiniest bit of what is really a significant and interesting collection. Um, you know, it's always interesting to imagine. Like, how did this collection get to Fayetteville, and and how did it get to the university? And I think that those are questions that I would hope are provoked by by the display. And the same is true for the decorative arts collections. We also are highlighting things that use water as a theme. So not merely um, oceans, but also I'm just looking at the window because a cat just passed by, and I lost my cat some days ago. Um, and um, and so. Um, you know, and uh, and so you know, I want to show a, a wide variety of things, including um, um, paintings and graphics. I'm very happy to have um, an Albert Pinkham writer who is, you know, from the same hometown as I am, and so uh, 
as another kind of personal affin uh, uh, affinity there. So, you know, that these are rooms that a viewer um, can decode in a very complex way. You know, I always think that with my installations, I want the viewer to be like a detective at a crime scene. You know, I want them to arrive and try to piece together from the available clues what's going on here. You know, what, what's happened? What is this about? And, and I, I think a project like this um, really rewards careful viewers. Um, and in fact, to be in the, in the water room, you have to be a careful viewer because the images themselves are, are quite changed by the blue light. Some of them um, are remarkably enhanced in a way, and some of them are somewhat obscured. And so you, you have to, you, again, you have to look with a different set of eyes when you come into this place. And you have to be able to understand each piece individually, but at the same time, see this as, as a composition. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think how you've conceived of the different rooms and all of the treatments also impacts the way that viewers move. So if from a kind of quick survey to really slowing down and there's something about letting your eyes adjust to being in this room that is very watery and blue. And I, I did wanna ask you, um, you of course have an art degree, but did you also take any kind of classes? How do you learn all of this science stuff? It's not usually part of an art education. Well, you know, I, I studied art uh, at the um, Hartford Art School, the University of Hartford, and then the School of Visual Arts, and then at the Whitney Independent Study Program, which was just, I mean, such an incredible, um, a place to study and, and such a, an uh, such a extraordinarily uh, disciplined uh, and and unique place to study and and that's where I, I met many of my um, closest friends who are still my friends today but then afterward I did study a little bit of biology really just to establish a, a, a kind of baseline um, a vocabulary that I could share at, at that point I, I really was committed to thinking about, you know the sort of culture of nature as uh, as my my field of investigation. I, mean, I knew that this was what I was most interested in. What the books I read were all around these issues. Uh, the the activities I did. I was like a, for a while. I was a very schizophrenic artist, right? I had um, you know I was very interested in critical continental theory, but then on the weekend I would go camping and fishing with my friends. And it took me a long time to understand that these were not two things, this, these, this was one thing, right? And that the same um, critical toolbox that I was assembling um, through, through readings and discussions with, with uh, one group of friends could be applied to the world I was exploring with, with another group. It should have been perhaps more <laughs> obvious. I'm not always the, the fastest on the take, but, um, Eventually, I brought those two things together, and and have really been able to uh, have that as my as my core concern for for you know the last thirty something years of working as an artist. Yeah, and just as you were mentioning the cabinet of curiosity and the wunderkammer, the um, disciplines of art and science weren't always so separate. That these today we think of them as two different practices or tracks in a university, but that was certainly not always the case. And of course, not always the case with artists in the 19th century and moving on um, for that. So I, I just think it's, um, it's natural, but also not all at the same time. So it was worth uh, mentioning. Um, Moira, next slide. And I just had to bring back in uh, oh, right. one of Jesse's drawings to again, kind of pull that curtain back on how we plan these things and why we were able to be, I think quite successful in doing all of this virtually until you came into town for four days to install. So this is her drawing on the top and then how it actually turned out uh, right here on the bottom. So I thought that would be fun to see. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how we could have done this without without Jesse and that um, 
especially if you if you remember back in the beginning i was making these kinds of drawings but all on a on a drawing board with with pencils and then sending them and and jesse would convert them almost immediately and every time i had to make a change i had to make an entirely new drawing whereas um jesse yeah. could move things around in real time and uh putting this puzzle together really would have been impossible without her yeah and for all of our viewers and especially if you haven't come to crystal bridges to see the exhibition yet please note this is just one of 10 sections in the exhibition so it's a very rich display but um my favorite is certainly elemental collections okay now we can go to the next So one of the most fun and um, kind of interesting tasks to do was um, materialize the vision of moving from water into fire and specifically with this doorway. So um, there are lots of fun conversations for behind the scenes, but do you wanna talk about the vision for that transition between spaces? Yeah, we really did wanna have um, the transitions, uh, the thresholds be as important as each room. So you enter air through a very high open space and uh, and the transition from earth to water is through a curtain, through a blue curtain, and then you enter into this blue world. And then I, the fire is always, uh, you know, I'm always thinking about the, the subterranean when I think about fire, I think about uh, not just coal mines and things like that, but on volcanoes, but also uh, the, the vision of hell itself. So I wanted to create a, a, a doorway that you would have to duck down. And also, um, you know, being a remarkably short person, it's always nice for me to do something to just stick it to all those tall people once in a while. <laughs> and so uh, it wasn't the easiest thing for the fire marshal to understand. and. Uh, even though the door is amply wide, and I think it's it's an, it's hard to imagine someone who would not be able to actually get through that door, uh, we still had to uh, had to convince them that this was a good idea, and it, it was it wasn't the easiest task. Okay, so I'm you know this to me again is uh, just props to Jesse and being able to kind of talk to the fire marshal about what the vision is. I'm sure people all the time think about, like we think about ADA compliance, which is usually making things short enough so that they're accessible for those who might be um, in a wheelchair, but we don't think about height very often. And so this was a question that the fire marshal had never really had. Like, what if we make a door that's five feet for people to go through instead? And, you know, sort of as a note and as a final um, compromise, we do have a secret door off to the side, um, primarily for, of course, emergencies. If, if we have to get a lot of people out of the gallery for a fire alarm or something like that, um, the fire marshal didn't believe that the five foot tall door would be sufficient for emergencies. So that's just a funny uh, sort of background. But I also love this photo because you can see the warmth coming just past the coolness of the blue room of um, uh, water and into fire. So Moira, next slide. And these are a couple of um, shots. So you can see sort of if you come around the corner to your right and then also to the left. And I think the last shot has a nice vision of the whole room with photo with people actually in it so next yeah i'm really loving what seeing these images with people yeah and so um some of the objects here are masks and lava and obsidian um, and prints so if you have any other uh comments about the objects in this room the well, the, I you know your print collection of um, you know it, of um, labor histories is is a, a, just an extraordinary thing on its own, and it was such it was so interesting to see the depth of that, and um, 
you know, as someone who's really interested in, in printmaking, uh, you know, to, to see the, this um, incredibly diverse and excellent collection uh, in, in really in so many different print media uh, and uh, that really depict the sort of, uh, um, you know, the, the dignity of labor. Uh, uh, so I was excited to be able to include a lot of those, which of course uh, deal with, uh, with um, smelting and processing of steel and, uh, and, um, and, and pouring liquid metal. So they're very dynamic and beautiful and they really, uh, they illustrate, um, uh, you know, the sort of power of fire in, in a sense. And, and they're, I think it's just a great inclusion. And, and we had so many to pick from because it is such a rich collection. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so one of the questions that came through that um, I think I've already answered um, is if you have a favorite pairing or combination of objects, you know, I've already mentioned the Benjamin West and the flying insects for me is just one of one of the special places. What is uh, what are some of the things that really extra special resonated with you? You know, I mean, I think that the, my, my favorite sort of moment is in Earth, where you have this, this, um, this sort of long pedestal, which is, has objects side by side by side. And, uh, and they range from uh, natural history specimens to folk art to vernacular objects and to, um, you know, extraordinary um, you know, examples of, of the, of natural history craft, you know, there's a, there's an armadillo with its shell peeled off of the skeleton. So you understand the structure of an armadillo. There are snakes in jars, there are cowboy boots, there's uh, um, sort of vernacular um, ceramics. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, a, a 65 million year old um, fossil tree. Uh, their scales is it's just the way that those objects are placed and you just go from one to the next and you have to you know it's it's almost a kind of rebus in a sense and and i really i think that that's a really interesting moment and then of course we have these masterful paintings above them right which you know depicting the landscape so i think that that whole section is really my favorite in a sense that that um it is just this co combination of objects that really exceed their um the sum of their individual parts yeah i agree and then i should also say this is the kind of exhibition that every time you come and spend a little more time and perhaps like turn left instead of right for example um i would encourage visitors will see things very differently you might notice something that just didn't seem to be there the first time and so those kinds of uh, moments of discovery or at least uh, different types of vision that comes from a different experience, you might be with a different person who notices something different. There's just a lot of rich um, aspects to discover. Now, one other question that I want to just tag and we'll, we'll keep talking is someone asked about the uh, plexiglass in front of the birds in the air section right. and um, that's on the right admittedly and Mark I think this happened after you left we peeled off the cover on the plexiglass and um, it's matte finish and so it's not terribly see-through or oh. at least it not it's not as much as you'd want so we have a new piece on order that should be here momentarily okay so, you know, <laughs> it does leave it a little bit fuzzy. And um, this was another favorite moment for me in planning the exhibition is we had all of these birds. Well, Larissa and I went to the University of Arkansas and Mary Sutter at the university is just an unbelievable person, um, the collections manager. And we were pulling out shelves and looking at birds and we had you on FaceTime to try to figure out which birds to select. And Mark, you would say, oh, well, the, you know, such and such bird should go on the left. And Loretta and I would say, okay, is it yellow 
or orange. <laughs> yeah, it was or very, it was very funny. Small. I say, well, I'll take the, I'll take the red winged blackbird and the bobling, and the meadow lark and the catbird, and you would look at me like, which one is that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm sure my birding husband is rolling his eyes right at this moment, thinking, oh gosh, if you'd ever just come with me, Mindy, you would know the difference <laughs> between those birds. For me, it's about Audubon, you know, and if it's an Audubon print and it has it written on the bottom, then I have more um, knowledge of it. So I well, think that, that, um, that's, that a, that's a good entrance awesome. entrance to it, to birding. Uh, you know, I think one, one of the interesting things that we haven't talked about is the fact that there are no labels and that that is, you know, I'm always trying to mess with people's expectations of what museums do and say and to in some way challenge their conventions and uh, and, and of course, um, I, I see time and time again, people sort of reading their way through exhibitions rather than looking, right? And, uh, and I'm not always sure how much that label gives you that you can't see on your own. And uh, certainly in the day that, the days where we all have supercomputers in our pockets, is it really necessary to spell out individually what things are. And, you know, I always think that, you know, museums are places that really, uh, you know, are, are striving to be the match that lights the fuse for inspiration and curiosity, um, you know, giving it all away or imagining that someone um, has consumed a work because they've read a label is, is, is very frustrating for me. So in this case, uh, intentionally, we haven't given things labels and and uh, and I know that's going to frustrate a lot of people but you know a frustrated viewer is an active viewer and uh, you know I Mindy does a lot of work I do a lot of work the whole team does a lot of work I think it's great if the viewer does a little bit of work too and and there's nothing here that is beyond their ability to um, to figure it out to figure out what it is when it's from, why it was made. And so I, I, you know, I want to push that responsibility back onto the viewer. Yeah, I agree. And that was another frequent question that we had as we were, you know, presenting this exhibition to our team and our leadership was what are we going to do when someone asks for labels? And my response is also, we're going to ask them to look anew at the objects. And so giving tours, uh, people ask me about, well, what's that object? I have never seen that before. And I'll be honest, I don't have all the names at the tip of my tongue. And so some of my answers are, isn't it interesting how that artist portrayed air? And look, when you're <laughs> next to, <laughs> you know, when you're next to a gas mask, it makes you see it very differently. So far, that's been satisfying. Perhaps someone will question me about that a little deeper. We do have an introductory panel that can ground people a little that says, you know, these are where the collection items are from. But I, I agree with you that sometimes people do go through museums as if they're checking off an inventory. Oh, I saw a Van Gogh. Oh, there's the Mona Lisa. Oh, I know this artist, that's a Wyeth. And just kind of going on and on. And how much did we actually see the object rather than just the name? So. I enjoy this um, exercise in looking that in experiencing something different. So thank you for addressing that. Now, Mark, this is a combination of my question as well as a question from a viewer. I'm dying to know how you organize your own collection. And then <laughs> a question is, are you a collector? And when did you start collecting? Boy, it's so hard to answer these questions in some way. You know, I'm, I'm always collecting, but not always for myself. So um, I'm collecting for a variety of work. So I, I was just out on Sunday uh, um, hunting flea markets and, and um, antique malls. And so I'm collecting for um, four or so different projects. So one, will be a, um, one is a sort of turn of the century naturalist shanty. One is a uh, 
somewhat contemporary marine biology laboratory. And um, so, I, you know, and, a, and one is a cabinet of electrical curiosities. So I'm looking for those things. And I'm also looking for my friends who collect things, who collect, you know, um, vintage textiles and uh, brushes and um, postcards of people in, um, in um, historical costume and, uh, and uh, marvelous um, transfer wear china. So, you know, so I'm looking for them and I'm also looking for myself and I, I you know, collect boxes and curious things to put inside of boxes. And uh, I like to, you know, I did a work some time ago called the memory box, which is a, a, um, a bit of a, it's a sort of tar paper shed. And inside the shed, there's a very large uh, shelf and it's filled with hundreds of boxes of all types of, you know, little tins and, and cigar boxes and, uh, and boxes made of precious material, boxes made of cardboard. And in every, well, every box is something remarkable, something really great. Uh, and people are supposed to go and spend time and have an intimate experience with this work, opening the boxes and looking. It's a tricky piece for, it's, it's, it's like a museum registrar's nightmare of an artwork. <laughs> Uh, but it is one of my favorite works that, I, that I've made um, because people do spend a lot of time and, and uh, a lot of the logic of the boxes are almost like surrealist object poems. So um, again, it's one of those pieces I like to stand outside while people are in because I hear them uh, giggling and gasping with astonishment. And that, that's really what I'm going for. Is that object on view right now? It's not actually. Not yet. Now, did you collect as a child? And then as a follow-up question, is there something in your collection that you'll never part with? Because I do know that things from your collections find their way into your installations in many places around the world. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I did collect as a child, but I, I really had no one who could help me um, uh, sort of discipline my collecting impulses. So, um, you know, I, I didn't have a, a sort of mentor who could introduce me to systematic scientific collecting or, uh, or the, the sort of science of, um, of uh, trading cards or anything like that. So, so I was a very sloppy, undisciplined collector. And, uh, and, and I sort of, you know, in some way, I'm still a little bit like that, uh, but if I could, you know, I'm in my studio now and I have a lot of things. Maybe I can, I don't know if I can, this will actually work if I show you. Uh, so up here, I have a large collection of finials. Can you see that, Mindy? Yes. So, um, so these are, these are these great finials. I love those. Stoneware, boxes, things in vials. Here's a collection of um, um, crayfish claws. And, um, you know, I don't know what else we have here. Here's a, um, oh, this is a bunch of fish, yeah. Anyway, there's a lot of things in here. Uh, no, no roadkill goes wasted in my neighborhood. <laughs> and I, I know that we also talked about how many animals you've had, um, as if you have a bit of a menagerie and have had different things over the years. Yes, yes, I, we're down to a, a horse, some chickens, cats, and dogs now. Nice. Okay, so another question is, were you inspired by the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum's eclectic collection in its immersive display? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I do really like that museum, but I didn't come to it as a child. So the, the museum that really inspired me as a child was the only museum I, I visited, which was the, the New Bedford Whaling Museum, which is, a, is a really a marvelous museum in New Bedford. And 
it's a museum of natural history. It's a museum of cultural history and social history. It has a great art collection of um, Hudson River School painters and people like um, Albert Bierstadt and and um, and um, Pinkham Ryder and um, uh, and William Bradford, all of whom lived uh, in New Bedford and Fairhaven. So uh, you know, so um, that was really my idea that you could mix history, natural history, social history, um, vernacular culture, you know, it has this great folk collection of scrimshaw that, and uh, that all of these, and fine art, all of these things could, can live extremely well side by side. And that, that always felt the way, to me, that, that museum set the template to what I think, what I thought a museum should be. And, and, um, and I guess obviously it, it set a very strong template because I'm still do, I'm still, <laughs> in some way trying to enact that. Well, I think that's the best message I've heard for making sure that everyone brings their children to museums to experience, you know, museums of all kinds, because- uh, I remember seeing a museum. Yeah, my encounter with the museum the first time was, was transformative. I mean, I do think museums are transformative spaces and, and I think that because I've experienced it. So I remember, going to the museum and thinking, what is this place? It's not, it's not a store. They're not trying to sell me anything. It's not a church. It's not a school. It's not a library. It, it's something else, you know? And, and just being very um, inspired by this idea that here's a place which is trying to convey knowledge through an encounter with things. Right, that that was for me um, uh, um, profound and transformative. Yeah, um, I do have to ask this very well stated question as well. Um, I love how this exhibition brings breaks down traditional museum display and expectations. How do you feel this display works to decolonize and critique museums as organizations and holders of power? Well, I think, yeah, well, that's very interesting because there's a lot of different kinds of power, right? But in how museums um, organize uh, and collect and what they collect and what, and what also, what other kinds of things are collected. So it's very interesting because of course the, you know, the art museum is collecting uh, um, these very exclusive objects, right? But, but if you look at the um, history collection at the university, it's really vernacular objects. It's really objects that um, uh, you know that have a, a primary function that are made by people uh, who who are working with them. And you know, I think that the uh, the sort of seed distributing plow that we have is a really um, amazing example of how something like that has. Um, has a kind of strength and an intelligence and a beauty that holds its own against any any artwork in this in this um, collection. So I, I think that in some way um, that that's somehow in the DNA of the, of this exhibition. I mean, there are other projects um, that I've done which are more sort of I would say explicit in their critique of of museological methodologies. Uh, I think this one it's it's a bit more subtle, but I think it's it's certainly there, and I and I think that it's it's not it's not difficult for a viewer to kind of tease that out in a sense, and to really um, you know there's a lot of questions that the exhibition brings up in terms of aesthetics and in terms of um, ideas like high and low culture and. And uh, you know, I think I think that that is very um, embedded in the in the exhibition itself. Yeah, and um, even in the lack of labels and the lack of um, you know, kind of asking people to see something differently rather than read the status of an artist, but rather look as if everything here is on equal footing in a different kind of way. Um, I think all of that is embedded in there as well. So, yeah, I think there's something very okay. nice about okay. there's something very nice about the way that um, nothing is authored in a sense. So, uh, if we did have labels, the artworks would have an author, but the 
um, but works that are made by in for uh, vernacular use wouldn't have an author, even though they are equally authored, right? So they are equally examples of of craftsmanship and and ability and and uh, and aesthetics. Yeah, and that value structure is very different because um, for a scientist who is studying um, eggs bird eggs, for example, there's a lot of rich, you know, material here, but without the label, you know, how does that also change even that specimen? Fascinating. Right. And we have one heck of an egg. Well, we have an original, oh, yes. we, have, we have a real elephant bird egg. We can actually see it right behind your head, uh, Mindy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, Fair. Which, you know, it's, there's not so many of those in, in, the, in this world. So I just saw one, um, I was just in Paris last week and, and there's an exhibition on the construction of nature in the 19th century, which, which is really, it was truly an excellent exhibition, but they also had an elephant bird egg, but not as intact and perfect as the one we have in our exhibition. Yeah, that's right it. Right there. Well, we are coming to the close of our time, even though I know we could chat for many, many more minutes. Um, is there anything else you want to share as a concluding thought before we thank a few people? Well, you know, I really, you know, one of my goals is not only in this work, but in, in general is to try to, I'm always trying to figure out how can I arrest the viewer in the space? And, you know, I, I'm really disturbed when I see people kind of racing through exhibitions and uh, and I'm as guilty of that I guess as anyone else but I, I, I really want to make something that does give someone a pause and really uh, and uh, and makes them spend time and look carefully and and I'm always building into exhibitions like this lots of Easter eggs to reward careful viewers and and so uh, you know I, I, I do, uh, you know, it's not how, how much you see, but how much you see well, right? And I, and I do I do really hope that this exhibition, um, that people do take the time and uh, to not breeze through it, but really experience it. Yeah, I agree. And of course, everyone can come back multiple times, but only until September 27th. So it is uh, essential that you get here to see essential collections. Um, and also, I want to take a moment not only to thank Mark, because we had a lot of fun on this, and I'm so glad we were finally able to work on a project together, but also to thank the University of Arkansas Collection, Mary Sutter and her team, Ashley Dowling and the Entomology team, as well as Jennifer Ogle of the Herbarium Collection. So we are so grateful for your partnership and help. And Mark, it was just great to see you on the Zoom and I hope we can stay in touch and see each other again soon. And Mindy, I should just thank you. I mean, it has been a delight to work together and I, I really, I enjoyed every minute of it. And yeah, I'm happy to think about this as our first project. I love it. And yeah. thanks also to all the Crystal Bridges folks that made this possible because Absolutely. it was just a lot of fun and a lot of work. But yeah. really worth it. So, and you can tell Landon that I have. Thank you, Mark. Oh, okay. I will tell Landon. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark, and thank you everyone for tuning in and come see the exhibition in person at Crystal Bridges. Thanks. Goodbye.